Hello everyone. Hope everyone is doing great. We will just wait for a couple of minutes for everyone to join in and then we'll start off with the webinar. So I guess I see everyone has joined in, so we'll get started. Hope everyone can see the screen okay. So first of all, I'd like to thank you all for joining today's webinar with our guest speaker, Michael English. My name is Devanshi and I am the Customer Success Manager at Locus. For people who are new to Locus, Locus is a legal practice management software that helps you streamline your day-to-day -day processes for your clients. In today's webinar, we are going to discuss how you can utilize Locus and build workflows to maximize efficiency. The webinar will be taken forward by our speaker, Michael English. Michael English is the owner of Chartered Consulting. He specializes in streamlining of solo and small law firms through practice management softwares. He's previously also helped a number of firms to optimize and make best use of Locus. And so before we start off, I would just like to state a few things. So we have a Q&A live for this session. So any questions any one of you have, you can put it in the Q&A and our panelists will either answer them throughout the webinar or we will take up uh, with Michael at the end of the webinar if in any case, any question requ requires any point of discussion. So uh, I hope you all can see the screen and without any further ado, I'll hand it over to Michael so he can take over the presentation and guide you all about workflows and throw more light on how you can utilize workflows to the maximum efficiency. Thank you, Devanti. Uh, all right. So to start off, uh, and she already mentioned a few of these, but what some of the objectives of the webinar that we're here to cover are what are workflows? How are they beneficial? How to plan before you build? Foundations of a workflow. And then we're going to discuss uh, some of the other functions, such as searches and conditions. Uh, one thing that I did not list here is exit roles and entry roles. So we'll go over those as well at the end, uh, as well as some common pitfalls uh, to avoid when you're building out these workflows. So what are workflows? A workflow is a series of steps that are followed in order to complete a particular task automatically. They are put into place to maintain a consistent process firm-wide. Now, if any of you are coming to LawKiss from somewhere like uh, my case or Clio or even Practice Panther, uh, workflows look a little bit different and in those uh, softwares. So a workflow there is more along the terms of a list of tasks or events. So you would basically just simply apply a certain workflow. It's not necessarily an automation so much as it is just a list of, uh, of to-dos. The difference of what Locus provides, and I'll read this off here, Locus offers intelligently designed workflows that ensure consistency, streamline processes, um, and automate repetitive tasks, saving valuable time in your day-to-day -day operations. So they take workflows um, to a whole new level in which the workflows become can become automations. So you're automating the creation of tasks, the automation of emails being sent out, literally like with minimal uh, touches to make those things happen. And so it it's supposed to save you that time and maybe even document drafting where the automations can pull cer certain documents with the merge fields already in there, or it can send out an email to a client with their name on it, personalization there. So like I said, it just takes it to a different level outside of other case management softwares out there. 
So how are workflows beneficial? The first is it enhances consistency to streamline your processes. So I can't stress this enough in which streamlining is only possible through consistency of your own process. And the next one is it ensures business continuity and seamless scalability. Now, if you don't know me, I come from a bit of a risk management background. So business continuity is a big word for me, is a big term for me, and I use it a lot. So in terms of case management software, uh, it's essential to business continuity. Uh, and if you're not familiar with what business continuity is, it's essentially the ability of your business to be able to continue uh, important processes in the event of an emergency. So let's say you have a lot that sits on a, on a single paralegal. You have one paralegal on your team and that person leaves your firm or goes on long-term leave, gets sick, and you got to find a quick replacement, either temporarily or permanently. Um, case management software is with the way that you design workflows and automations, it basically holds you accountable to your processes and anybody stepping into, uh, into a particular role, it makes it easier for them to pick up where somebody else may have left off. So you have tasks that are being generated on these matters automatically. And so when a new person steps in, they'll know exactly what they need to do. And that's what the, what LawKiss can do for you. Um, it minimizes complacency and errors. I think we're all capable of a little complacency from time to time. You're doing uh, a lot of the same things over and over and over again. And the more often you do them, the more potential you have to make mistakes. Um, you know, we're only human, right? So with this, like it just keeps your, uh, again, we go back to that consistency, right? Um, with workflows and automations, it keeps your process consistent and it always tells you what you need to do next. Um, it elevates client communication. So, you know, that's where we talked to, or I mentioned before, you can automate emails. Or you can even have tasks to send an email to a client. And then on top of that, you have um, you have email templates that you can use just to make that process a little easier. It just makes it less painful when having to remember to communicate with a client and even to the extent that the software can remember to communicate to the client for you. Um, if you're not familiar with something such as trademark law, uh, or if you are, like these cases can sit up to 18 months long when you're trying to get a trademark approved. And so what do you do in that time? Well, the client's not going to, you know, wait around for, you know, they're 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 not a lot of times they're gonna be like, well, what's going on with with my file? You know, well, well you don't have an up, you know, you don't have an update to give them. But this can, you know, you can have the software sending out emails every single month over the next course of 18 months to that client, even if there is no update to give, it keeps that communication flowing for you. And you don't even have to remember to do it. It does it for you. Um, and efficiencies in uh, document drafting. Again, mentioned it before, you know, you have the merge fields that you can place into these document templates and you know pulling some of the more basic information out of your client files such as names addresses and then you can even put these into the workflows themselves to where uh, they get auto generated and placed into a client file because maybe it's just your process that you know every time this client we do this we need this document and so you can set those rules and those workflows to every time this 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 thing happens then this document gets pulled. Uh, in summary, LawKiss workflows are a game changer. They provide a strategic advantage to optimizing processes, automating tasks, and fostering a more productive and reliable working environment. <clears throat> now, what are the, some of the prerequisites for building workflows? This is extremely important. I cannot stress this enough. 
write out processes in the form of standard operating procedures now or SOPs as I call them. Uh, now, what are these? These are the step-by-step -step and as detailed as possible instructions of from when for whatever process you have in the firm, whether it's uh, handling <clears throat> leads or a particular case type, or even down to like, you know, when you're drafting a document, like what are the steps that you want to go through? This is a part of that building out a consistent model. Um, so some examples is, you know, with leads, how do you handle your leads? What does your onboarding process look like? What are the steps involved in that? When do leads get contacted and how often are they contacted? Are there different steps depending on the services a lead is looking for, i.e. Uh, estate planning versus probate leads? And then what are actual tasks that need to be accomplished step by step in order to bring a case to closure? So now we're talking about the matters. And then it even get into, well, what other third party software is involved in this process that needs to be taken into consideration? Here we're talking about stuff like Decision Fault or Wealth Council. Um, and then what are some of the responsibilities of individuals in your firm? So these need to be clearly defined in your SOP. Um, this again, this is part of that business continuity aspect. So, uh, you know, you would just, this is the paralegal's duties. So now if any, if you have a new paralegal go in, they can see this and know exactly what needs to happen. Now with law kids, we can actually take these SOPs and build them out into the software itself so that, you know, it's not, you won't have to constantly even refer back to these SOPs. Locus tells you what the next steps are. So, and that's what we're kind of getting into next is how do we do that? All right, so the foundations of a workflow. So the first thing is we have triggers. This is the how. This is the action that is taken, which makes a workflow or automation run. How does this happen? The action is the what. These are the events that occur after a workflow or automation has been triggered. So actions are what you want to happen. And then the trigger is how you want it to happen. The searches, this feature is used as a way of ensuring that a workflow has all the necessary data to ensure the actions are being triggered occur smoothly. And then the helpers, these are the rules or conditions set within a workflow, which may trigger different outcomes or actions. And we're going to go through all of these. The first one being triggers. So as you can see, we have a lot of different options here. Matter created, matter updated, matter moved to stage, matter closed, leads, all uh, and so on and so forth, task completed. Uh, so again, these are the things that are making a workflow run. So when perhaps maybe you complete a particular task, it, then you tell the workflow, okay, well, when I complete this task, you know, I want this to happen. Okay. So the trigger is what makes the automation run. All right. And so I'm going to show you in Locus here as well, or Locus here as well. All right, so if I want to, again, I'm in automations and workflows and I want to add a new workflow. And here's where I select my trigger. So let's walk through some of the common ones here that I use on a regular when I'm working with a client. So a big one is perhaps when a matter is moved to a stage. So I say, all right, matter moved to stage. And then I select, well, what stage 
what what pipeline do I want this to be applicable to? And then I select the stage. So that means when I'm setting the trigger to be whenever a matter enters this particular stage, that a certain action is going to occur. So it's only going to apply to matters that enter that stage. Let's look at another one here. Calendly. That's another a new popular one that we're playing with since Locus has uh, done a great job getting this Calendly integration up and running. So we have, you know, a variety. We select. Basically, we're saying when a new Calendly event gets booked, we want a certain action to occur. So we select, you know, the new Calendly schedule or appointment, and then we select what appointment we want that apply to. Intake form submitted. So that could be your uh, the initial intake that you send out to a client. All right. Uh, before you do your consultation. So whenever that intake gets submitted, then we want another action to occur. Maybe it creates a task for the user to review the intake or it moves them to or you know moves them to another stage, which we'll get into those actions. So those are just a, a, a few examples. Um, you know, e-sign document signed is another great one to use. Uh, and those e-signs are we're talking about the uh, e-sign templates that we use like through HelloSign to send out to clients or when they're signing maybe an agreement. So now I'm just going back to my presentation here. Now let's get into actions. Now, again, this is the what. This is what we want to occur when a trigger, when it's triggered. So we have create matter, create lead, update matter, update lead, or add a task, send an email, create a document. Uh, so a lot of great options that we have here. So let's go back to our LawKiss account here. Back to workflows. All right, so remember we need to set of what our trigger is. So we'll just say for now, when a matter moves to a particular stage, now we select our action. So just to show you from the full workflow view, here's our trigger. And now once it moves to this stage, what do we want to occur? So we're going to add an action item here. So again, some common ones that I typically use. Update matter. Uh, update matter is is uh, is great way to automatically move matters in your pipeline. I use that to move them to one state from one stage to the next. Uh, so like if you wanted to do that, you got you first is the setup, selecting the matter ID. And so basically you're telling Lawkiss that this is how you tell, like, you know, it's it's finding the matter for you or it's adding the details to the matter here. So we're we want to pull this information based off of the trigger. And that's going to tell it what matter this is basically applying to. And then the matter pipeline. And so like, you know, I wanna change it to a different stage. And so based off, you know, we'll put it in, it's gonna be in this pipeline and then in this stage. You know, this is just an example. That's how you automatically move it from one stage to the next. I usually do this with like, when you complete a task, I want it to update the matter to the next stage. So just as an example there. Um, or, you know, another great one is I wanted to send an email to a client. 
And so here is where I can select who is it coming come from. And this is where, you know, this is how Locus is going to be pulling that information. They're going to be pulling it based off of how it's being triggered. So I want it to, so, so I select use matter value from trigger, and I want it to be sent from the responsible attorney. And then I select the recipient. And I'm going to use matter client. And then I can either use an email template that I already have drafted in here, or I can just type it in here as well. Then I can even have Locus create a document for me. So again, I'm pulling it's going to be the information that's pulling is from the trigger. And so based off of whatever the matter ID or lead ID is, it's going to be able to pull the information that's inside that file and into whatever document I choose. All right. So basically what I've created is a various number of different actions that I want to occur. So once this matter moves to this stage, these are the things that I want to happen. And they're all going to occur at the exact same time. And then I can even add a task to this. And so that's telling that that's going to task is going to be assigned to that matter. Review file. And then I can assign it to whoever I want. I can choose uh, a matter of value or assign it to somebody specific. So yeah, that's the gist of creating actions. So again, this is what you want to occur and this is how you want it to happen. So sometimes whenever you're designing these workflows, you kind of have to work backwards a little bit it's like, you know, I want this task. Okay, so how do I get that to occur? All right, searches. So if you've ever played around with these workflows, uh, you'll find that some triggers won't allow you to necessarily do certain things uh, in a workflow. And part of that might be because you need to include a search because some triggers won't uh, basically won't provide you like what's the best way to explain this is that it won't give uh, the the workflow enough information uh that you need for a certain action to occur. So searches allow it to actually search the matter and get that data that you need. So it makes things a little more uh, a little more cleaned up in your workflow. So I'll show you a good example of that. So let's say, Let's say I completed a particular task. You know, that that's going to be the trigger for this. And when that task is completed, I want it to send an email. So you'll notice here, well, I can't choose, you know, like we saw before, where we could choose between the originating attorney or the responsible attorney. I can't choose that. I can't. It doesn't have that information for you. If I go to recipient, you know, I might be able to find the client that I wanted to send a message to. So how do I get this to actually populate? So I would go, you know, and sometimes this is trial and error for a lot of uh, people that are new to this. So you just kind of got to play with the searches to see what gives you the best results sometimes. But th in this instance, we're going to use search matter. And I want it to search a matter. 
and I just go over here, click this button here, use task value from trigger. So the matter ID or lead ID. So basically I want it to search that matter that the task was triggered from. Now, if I go back to my send email, I can select here and now it can find it for you. So now I can select one of those. All right, well now, what if I want to put the client, what if I wanna personalize this a little bit? I wanna put the client's name in there. Hello, such and so. If I go over here and use matter value, well, there's not really a good option here for that. So what's another way you can find the client's name? Well, we would go to search client. Let's type it in. And so basically it's going to search the details on the client now. Now, if I go back over here and I want to use it, that use client value from step three. So that, that's something else I should point out. You, you'll be able to see step two, step three. And so that's saying the different actions. That's This is action step two, step three, okay? So I want us to do it from step three. And now I can pull their first name, maybe. So... You know, I can say, hello, Michael, you know, and so that's a note, that's some tips on there to get that those details pulled. And then, you know, with the search matter, I can pull like different, any, you know, different various custom fields that I've created if I want that information put into those emails. So just some things to think about there. So that's search matter and search client. So again, you'll have to play with those to get used to what information it's, give, it's going to be able to give you to be able to use to improve your workflows or personalize emails that are going out to clients. It does take a little bit of getting used to on those, but once you once you have it, it's pretty much second nature for you. You kind of know like, okay, I'm going to need to add a search client here because of this particular trigger that I'm using. Uh, the the other one is um, say lead created. and search lead. So I know this sounds like a bit of a a no-brainer, <laughs> but uh, search lead is only for those that are in the lead pipeline. But it basically, you know, can provide some of the same, uh, you know, functions as uh, as the other searches, but just for the lead side. Uh, a, well, one reason that I typically use search lead is new Calendly appointments. And so I wanted to search for perhaps their last name. And this is where you can add those, you know, stop workflow if it's found uh, or stop workflow if it is not found. So if, you know, if you don't find them, it doesn't perform. But yeah, this is a great way to, uh, to use search lead. All right, back to our slideshow. All right, so now we have helpers, okay? Now with the helpers, this can real, this is where you get into the real nitty gritty a bit with, with building out workflows. Uh, you have logic, con uh, logic conditions, filters, delays, and reminders, okay? So, Logic conditions, uh, and I'm just going to go through some of the one the the ones that I use the most here. 
uh, logic conditions are basically where you where when you see in a workflow basically you know like the tree branch so um if if this then that kind of thing um so if let's say you complete a particular task in a workflow and then the actions are going to defer between maybe a particular custom field so let's say uh, a client that is married versus uh, somebody that's just an individual. You can have the uh, the automation do different things based off of that that particular factor. So if I go back to my locus, and I'm just going to create a quick custom field here. And we're not going to dive into creating custom fields. That might be for some for another discussion. Okay. Let's just go back to this task completed. So I'm just going to pull up the logic condition. And I'll just I'll actually show you from here. If I scroll all the way down, you'll find the logic and the the can the helpers at the bottom here. And so if I just like logic condition, I'll have branch A and branch B. So I have to set the conditions for each of those. Oh. That's one of those things where I have to include a search matter. So I'm going to search the matter because I can't, based off of just a, a trigger being, an automation being triggered off a task, you typically will have to add that search matter action and so that you can pull these custom fields. So now I can see my custom field married. If yes, is no. All right, and I'll just add a random action here so that you can see. Okay. All right, so now I'm telling this workflow, when a task is completed, if the client is married, this is what I want to occur, these actions. If they are not married, then I want just this to happen. So that is a great way to you know, really um, personalize what's going on with your clients. You can send out different types of emails, generate different types of documents. You know, if married, I want a, a joint agreement generated or or um, or an individual, you know, we would be able to pull those and specify those or even through e-sign templates. You know, I want this agreement versus that agreement. So, you know, it's a great way to use those uh, custom fields within logic conditioning. Uh, so another that we should talk about are filters. So this is basically just adding another con singular condition um, that you know that you can use. So it's very it's it's similar to that of logic conditioning, uh, but basically I would just add a condition and. Let's say, you know, consultation status is ready. All right, so now I'm saying, you know, when this task is completed, if they are not married, I want this task gen generated. And if they are also consultation status shows as being ready, then I want this email getting sent out to them, okay? So it's just another way to add an additional condition on here. All 
All right, another one to talk about is, um, let me get my trigger set up here. Time delays. So these are great in which like if you like, let's say you send out an engagement agreement um, to a client, you know, you move them to this stage and you send out an engagement agreement to the client and well, you know, you want to regularly follow up with them, but you know, you don't know how to set those follow ups without all of them going out at once. Right. So that's where time delays come in. So let's say, you know, you move them, you've sent out the engagement agreement. So now they're sitting in the stage engagement invoice. So, you know, we're waiting on, you know, those things to be received. And so now you want to send out automated emails to the client. So you can set up uh, a set of emails to go out using time delays. So the first would be, so you're saying a delay, let's use delay for a set amount of time. And I'm going to say, five days all right so basically after five days from this trigger from being moved into this stage i want to send an email okay so after five days i want to send that email to the client now well, what if you want to set up more than one of these? All right. So one thing to really keep in mind is that all these delays are being set off of the day that this workflow was triggered, not off of the last action via i.e. send email. It's off of the trigger. Okay. So if I want to send out an email every five days, the next delay. would be 10 days, okay? So again, these are from the trigger date, okay? So this is how you set them up like consistently after, uh, uh, you know, every five days or six days or however many you want to set. You have to think about it from like when that trigger occurred, okay? So if I want it, to, uh, so yeah, uh, that's that's how you utilize delays. And of course, I would at that point send another email to the client. Okay. All right. Now let's talk about the exit rules and the entry rules, okay? So these are just as important as any other piece of the uh, of the automation build out. An exit rule is a condition in a workflow that is meant to stop the workflow from continuing or even starting for that matter. Uh, an entry rule is a condition in the workflow that must be met before the trigger initiates the workflow. So let's dive into what those look like. So something that I implement heavily in uh, building these out is workflows based off of task completion. Now, this is where entry rules come into play. So let's say, I, uh, and you've seen me select this already before, I want to trigger a workflow based off of a task completed, but I don't want it to trigger off of just any task. I have to specify what task I want it to be based off of. So that's where I add an entry rule. So it's basically, if, this, if a task is completed and the title of that task is review, file okay so that's saying that in order for this to trigger the workflow 
the task that is being completed has to be titled review file. Okay, something to bear in mind with this particular trigger is that uh, the task title has, uh, you know, I you want to, uh, you you really want to make sure the condition, you know, you can either do it contains, you know, it just contains that name, or if you use is file review file you know, that task has to match up to that very specific task. No, no more letters, no more or less. <laughs> so, uh, so anytime this particular task is completed, now I get to have a certain action complete, uh, uh, occur. So when that test is completed, I wanted to add the next task. Send to client or Okay, so now, I'm again, I'm saying if this task title, if the title of the task is review file and it gets completed, then this next task gets created. So one of the benefits of using this type of workflow, and again, I use this a lot, is uh, a common complaint that I've heard out of other softwares is that huge list of tasks that are generated at the onset. You know, you have like 20 different tasks that you have to be able to click through. Um, this prevents that clogging of tasks. So basically every time a, a, it ensures that maybe like one, two, maybe three tasks are only created at a time. I mean, you can have it create as many as you want, but when one task is completed, then the next task, and then the next, and then that task is completed, and then it creates another task. So it just keeps the workflow moving, your process moving through the pipeline as you complete one task and then it generates the next one. Okay. Now let's go back to our, our emails that are being sent out to a client. This is where we're going to be discussing entry rules. I mean, exit rules. So, you know, you right now, how this is set up is that every five days, a client is going to receive an email to tell them, you know, hey, we need the engagement agreement uh, signed and your invoice paid. But at some point, they're going to send those into you. They're going to complete those tasks of theirs, but they're still going to keep getting these emails. So that's where exit rules come into play. So exit rules will stop the workflow based off of a certain condition being met. Okay, so, and you can use any type of, uh, you know, condition, but for this instance, you know, you would say lead stage is not engagement and invoice. So right now we're sitting, we've moved the lead to engagement invoice and now those automated emails are being sent out to the client or to the lead, but when they are no longer in that stage, perhaps they've been converted to a matter and no longer exist in the lead pipeline, we want those emails to stop. So this is saying when the lead stage is not engagement invoice, then these emails need to stop. All right. So that was basically, you know, the last portion of these of building out these workflows, um, you know, and uh, there's a lot more that you can really dive into on these because you can you can go very deep into building out these workflows. So I could spend all day talking about it, to be honest. Um, I probably spent more time than I need to already. <laughs> so, uh, but and and. You know, as kind of the final part of this, you know, let's talk about some common pitfalls to avoid. Uh, not fully testing your pipeline before putting into action. Uh, yeah, this one is big because, you know, wh whenever I build these out, like I test it over and over and over again. And then, uh, you know, I even wait a few days after that and then test it again. So, uh, I just, you know, it's a way of making sure that everything works the way you want it to. Uh, giving too much of your firm over to automations. 
you can go crazy with this. Uh, you know, I've made that mistake of, you know, going too heavy on the automations. You really want to strike a balance between, you know, personalized communication, like you picking up the phone and calling the client versus, you know, these automated emails going out. Because in the day we, of age we live in now, people recognize when an email is being automated. Uh, is, so you really want to balance that to where you don't sound too much like a robot. Um, not outlining your processes beforehand. If you jump into this and just start building out workflows without a plan beforehand, you know, it's, it's easy to get lost in the build. Um, not writing out the automation step-by-step -step before building. This is, you know, you have your process. Now you need to write out what automations you want to build. What are your intentions? Um, and the most important part, know your process and automations by heart. You need to know these things like the back of your hand. So that'll allow you to make sure, you know, to trust the automations and understand what is triggering what and um, allow you, give you some uh, confidence in what you've built out and, you know, allow you to also keep those processes updated when new things come around. So that's all that I have uh, for this. And I think now we can enter into the Q&A session. But otherwise, oh, you know, like yeah, and, and thank you. And I, pre you know, again, I appreciate everybody listening to me. <laughs> so I know I can ramble on a lot about this stuff. <laughs> so You were great. I hope all our attendees were able to gather a lot of insight about workflows. And I hope Michael has answered almost all of your questions. So with the Q&A, Michael, we have um, Ryan who's asking, like, how do you test your workflows? So from an attorney point of view, from a consulting point of view, how do you suggest like clients test their workflows before actually putting it into action? And say, say that question one more time. And how do you test your workflows? Like before putting it into action for your actual clients, how do you basically prefer testing the workflows? Uh, you know, the best way to do it really is, um, so there's there's two things that I like to implement uh, when when testing clients, especially, or testing a workflow, especially like if you've already got clients that you're working with inside these pipelines, um, and here I'll, I'll, I'll show you a little bit, uh, of what I typically try to do. So, uh, let's say you're building out a lead pipeline and, you know, you probably have like a dozen or, you know, two dozen leads already sitting in there, but you want to test out these automations without it affecting, um, those that you already have in there, right? Uh, so that's yeah, another way in which I can set a uh, an exit rules. Um, so what I'll typically use are the uh, tag feature. So I'll create a matter or a yeah let's go back a tag, and I'll say testing. And so I'll put this into each of my, so I'll use, you know, the exit role, potential matter tag, um, testing. So basically I'm trying to, uh, um, I'm telling it that if a matter does not have this tag, then it will not trigger that workflow. So every time, so whenever I have a test client, I'll create a test client. I'll put this tag on them. So then it'll trigger these automations for me. So that's how I, how I, I'll, I'll put that exit rule on all the automations. So that way it only triggers for those clients that have that testing tag in it. And then you're not affecting the other current leads or clients that you have already built into your pipeline. 
Thank you so much, Michael. So basically, the gist is create a test line, run through the workflows a number of times, and then you'll finally find the errors. You can see all the errors in the history section of your workflows, and then you can rectify those errors accordingly, whatever messages you get. So the next question is creating workflow logic condition for documents. So basically, uh, this question is asked by Jill. So Jill, this is basically can be based on tags. This basically can be based on matter practice areas. It can be based on custom fields. And you can have a logic condition based on custom fields, tags, or practice areas. And then you can generate a number of document templates for each type of case. So you need to basically like have an identifier either as a tag or as a custom field or as a practice area. And then the document template can be generated according to the identifier. And yes, you can have logic condition to generate different types of documents for different cases. I guess, Michael, this is... Uh, Okay, we have Jackie who's asking, sometimes my workflows just stop working. Why does this happen? Oh, uh, Jackie, uh, if your workflow stops working randomly, you should always check the history. Why the workflow has stopped? It will always show some error message. Let us know what error message you get. Uh, sometimes it'll be very easy for you to understand. Maybe the email integration is broken or the email is missing or if you're sending an sms the phone number may be missing so some things will just be very direct but sometimes you will not be able to identify why the system is giving you error so you can always reach out to us on support let us know that my workflow is giving this error and we can always help you with that yeah and and uh to add to that like like Devanshi says you know check your errors and to do that you go to um, the history over here, and this is where it's going to show you if the workflow triggered or if it stopped. You know, there might be a certain rule in there that needs to maybe go away. I wonder if I have one that shows, let's see. I was hoping I had one that actually showed a bit of history on it. Um, oh, I bet I know which one. Oh, you can directly check it from the task history over here. Yeah, okay. But yeah, uh, that's one way to check it. But yeah, I, I don't really have a good example. <laughs> so <laughs> Mostly during the initial test and trial of the workflows, you will get a lot of errors because sometimes the mapping does not eventually come up right because we may change the trigger in between we may change the actions in between so at that point the workflow mapping gets disturbed so at, at that is the major thing that results in a lot of errors in the workflow so to avoid these basic small errors you need to make sure that if you are editing any of the actions or any of the triggers on workflows you need to make sure that everything after that, like each action after that needs to be remapped. Because like if I edit the add task and I do some changes over there and I am using that task information in the update matter step. So it will completely like disturb the mapping. So you need to make sure that you are remapping all the actions after the action step that you have made changes to. So this will basically help you a lot to avoid errors because we may not understand that, okay, I've just made a random small change, but technically it disturbs the workflow completely. And to answer your question, Ivan, no, you cannot like reorder these steps in the workflows because this eventually results in disturbing the mapping of each and every step. So you have to delete and add step but you cannot like reorganize these things. Uh, 
I guess we have answered mostly all of the questions. Anybody have any other questions? Uh, so Ivan has one more question. So he's saying copy and paste the steps in the workflow so that it's easy to repeat. Uh, this can also arise a lot of problems because some steps you will use another mapping, some steps you will use another mapping. So if you have 10, 20 steps in the workflows, you will not uh, like one may be mapped to a matter, one may be mapped to a client. So if you copy and paste, it will disturb the mapping completely because the mapping is done based on the previous step. So copy and paste is also not an option on workflows. This is the only thing that is a drawback that if you don't re-add the steps, you just make those changes, it will completely disturb your workflow. So make sure either you delete the step or if you are just updating that step, you are mapping each and everything. Like if you have used the client name, if you have used the matter ID, if you're using any of this information from the previous steps, you are remapping all those things completely. So everyone who is asking for the sample workflows, yes, we do have workflow samples, but we have it as a CSV file. So after this webinar, I will send across that CSV file to all of you guys. So you can have those samples and using those samples, you can implement workflows in your account and you can customize that according to your practice. That is just a basic sample that we have prepared. You can completely customize it and then you can create a workflow in your respective Locus accounts. Okay, I guess we've answered all of the questions. Anybody has any other questions? Okay, Michael, I think we've answered the questions. Thank okay. you so much, Michael, for this. We really appreciate you taking time and hosting this webinar and guiding all of our clients on how they can build workflows. And I hope each attendee has gathered a lot of insight about workflows. If after this webinar, anybody has any questions, they can always reach out to the Locus chat support. Our customer support team will always be there to assist you. And if yes. you have any questions, you can also email me. Over to you, Michael. Yes, and uh, thank you, Locus, and uh, for hosting this webinar for us. And, um, you know, uh, echoing back, I, I hope I was able to provide some knowledgeable information on, you know, how to build out these workflows. And yeah, Locus, is, Locus has some great customer service for being able to help people out. And, um, and if anybody ever wants to reach out and ask me questions, I'm on, you know, I'm of, of course on Facebook, or you can email me at michael at streamlinemylawfirm.com. I know it's a long one, but hey, it's, it's catchy. So. <laughs> If anybody like wants to set up workflows or automations and they need help, uh, you guys can always reach out to Michael. If you don't have his contact information or email you don't remember, you can always like reach out to us and ask for his details. He can help you like build out your workflows. If you are looking for implementation services, he can help you build out your automations and guide you through the process uh, uh, through the process. So guys, I hope this webinar was really helpful and we continue, uh, like we want to continue doing this webinar and I guess I've received this poll that next webinar you want to cover the document automation and intake forms. So hopefully we'll plan a webinar with respect to this and uh, 
see you guys next month with another topic and something new that we can help you with thank you so much guys for joining and have a great day take care thank you michael so much thank you bye bye